a gene check and uh, welcome to GitHub. Uh, I'm Ravi and Dave. I'm, I'm Dave Bernison, uh, Senior DevOps Advocate with GitHub. Uh, so welcome everybody. We're very happy that we can host you here uh, in our beautiful office here this evening and e each month. Um, just a couple of things, actually helps turn it on. Uh, you can put focus on, yeah, just tap, tap the screen so the focus is on the, okay. nope, it, there, focus, there we go. So um, just a couple of things, you know, respect the space, keep, keep it clean. Love to have everybody here. If you need something, <clears throat> ask myself or Ravi, or we've got a couple other GitHub employees here. Um, see any questionable behavior, please notify a community manager or GitHub employee. You know, we're here for the community, so we want the community to be here for us as well, kind of a thing. Uh, I'm gonna, GitHub Copilot, right? Everybody's talking about AI. GitHub Copilot can help you as you're developing uh, AI applications and such. So I just wanted to provide, you know, a number of resources. Uh, this learning pathway is brand new. I think the blog post just came out yesterday, maybe about this, but a great overall walkthrough in that. Hold your phones, I'll, there'll, be, there'll be a number of URLs here, uh, <laughs> but that, that's a great brand new resource. Uh, Copilot related blog posts. So when you go to github.blog, um, we tag all the blog posts, whether it's GitHub Advanced Security, Copilot Actions, whatever, but there's a whole section on Copilot. That's where we have all of our announcements and everything. Uh, product updates, you can see uh, even the little incremental updates. We had some model updates that we announced last week, which, you know, not a big splash on the blog, but still, if you're following along, you want to you know the details there. Uh, previews. So we're very transparent with what's coming down the pipe. You know, you can go to the previews and perhaps sign up and be part of the beta and, and things like that. And then also we're transparent in what we're working on next. So githubnext.com, you can see what our research team is working on. And you can see some of their past initiatives that are now part of the product uh, and everything. And then finally, there's a GitHub Copilot playlist on YouTube. Uh, there was one posted there about 10 days ago, I want to say, about prompt crafting. Highly encourage you to check out anything you see about prompt crafting, because as you, you know, learn and understand prompt engineering, prompt crafting, especially as it relates to GitHub Copilot, you'll get a lot more out of Copilot uh, than, than you would just kind of cruising along in, in Visual Studio Code or, or whatever the case may be. So screen, go ahead and take a screenshot. That's the last bullet point on this one. And then Dave, uh, in addition to that learning pathway, like the, uh, it's a, just a PM plug. Uh, I work on GitHub Advanced Security, but then there are tons of other uh, GitHub certifications rolled out. If you're interested, you can go to the learning site, which is just, you saw the link, and it will take you to other uh, products as well, not just Copilot. And if you're interested, you can start with GitHub Hub Foundation, then you can go to uh, GitHub uh, other certifications. Right, well. whether it's Actions or GitHub Advanced Security or yes. yep, administration, yep. Um, some announcements. Last week, we announced the launch of GitHub Copilot Enterprise. Everything we've had for GitHub Copilot Business has been part of extensions to Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, JetBrains, which the JetBrains ones are going GA uh, in a, later this month, it should be in a few days, kind of a thing. But GitHub Copilot Enterprise, now we're bringing Copilot directly to the GitHub platform itself. Uh, so you can dive into your code using Copilot. If I'm asked to add a new feature, I can ask Copilot to help explain the existing code to me so I know exactly where I need to go to get started. For example, lots of things you can do there. An event we have, we'll have here, GitHub Galaxy on May 15th. So it, it's pretty enterprise focused, um, but 
It'll be in multiple cities, but we'll have it here on May 15th. I think that's it. Ravi, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, yep, I think we are all good. And we are, though we are confined in this space, but yeah, we have restrooms on the right side. We ah, have also water cups. And then uh, if you feel that you, you need something else, do just reach out to us. So welcome everybody, enjoy the event. Yeah, welcome. Great, thanks, thanks, Devi, thanks, uh, Ravi. Uh, yeah, uh, co-pilot, I think it's great. And uh, you haven't tried out yet, I do strongly recommend that you give it a try. As I mentioned about the check-in functionalities, and it literally, I implemented like two hours ago before the events, and I use in the co-pilot. And it seems like working fine. I'm not sure if did you guys have any bug or anything, but uh, I think it works great. Um, so uh, yeah, great, thanks for uh, hosting us. And uh, I think that's all for me today. And uh, we are going to come our tech talk, our first speaker, uh, Heiko, he already here. So uh, Heiko, uh, he going to speak about uh, uh, use cases for speech and uh, ge uh, generative AI. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Heiko. There we go. The green button means it's actually on. <laughs> All right. Oh, even better. Then I have my hands free. Um, all right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Heiko Rommel. I'm a principal uh, PM lead at uh, um, Azure, um, uh, part of the Azure AI uh, team, in particular, uh, working on the speech service. Um, I've been with Microsoft for a little over 20 years now. I've been working on speech stuff even uh, longer than that. So that's the one thing I, I know. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk to you a bit about uh, sp speech plus Gen AI. Um, but before I get into those use cases, um, I just wanted to give a quick um, overview of Azure AI and sort of where the, you know, the different pieces that we're talking about are gonna uh, fit in. So we have on the uh, bottom, there's the all Azure infrastructure. Uh, and then we have Azure machine learning that we use to train models and, and, and also, you know, be able to host a, a whole bunch of uh, models like open source models as well. And then in the top left corner, you see Azure OpenAI. Uh, that's where we have, um, you know, all the wonderful large language models uh, uh, from OpenAI. And then the one uh, couple to the right is um, Azure AI Speech. And that's the piece that um, I'm part of and, and that we're working on. Um, and so if you then look at the uh, speech service, uh, you know, we have sort of the things that you would expect, like input into speech. In, you know, in uh, from speech, so speech to text, uh, output, text to speech. Uh, we also can do speech translation and speaker recognition. Uh, one thing to point out on the speech to text side is, is that we have whisper part of uh, our service um, as well. Um, and we've also recently um, added the OpenAI TDS voices uh, to our text to speech service. And then we have a bunch of uh, tools like our speech studio, which you'll see um, and our speech SDK that you can use to um, interact with um, in our service in, in your applications. And you can run this on the cloud or um, on-premise in containers and even on uh, edge devices. And so the team that I work in powers um, also all the uh, speech recognition and uh, uh, text-to-speech um, capabilities of that you see in, in Microsoft products um, all around. So just that, just as a little bit of a of a context. 
So um, speech plus Gen AI, and, and what are sort of the, the high level kinds of scenarios? And um, there are really sort of two top level, very broad um, kinds of things. Uh, one is sort of the obvious one probably, which is uh, spoken chat um, is, is how we tend to term it. Um, so, you know, you have a human that is interacting uh, with a, you know, thing like ChatGPT or, or other things like that um, uh, to get a task done, to get information, um, you know, that can be used in a range of um, situation from, you know, automated um, call center answering things or call routing um, to, you know, um, things that uh, help you get tasks done maybe on your mobile phone or in on like kiosks um, that you might interact with voice. Um, the other one is uh, speech analytics. And that is an area where there's a lot of human to human conversations or a single human presenting something like I'm giving a talk right now. Um, and there's a lot of content that is being recorded or live broadcast um, and getting insights into those kinds of things can be very um, useful. Um, this can also, and we, we will get into sort of detailed um, examples of, of that um, in a little bit. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about spoken chat. Um, and I thought, you know, why not uh, start the whole thing um, by just uh, showing a little bit of code and then running a little demo and hopefully uh, with uh, all the uh, uh, environment here, everything will work well. So here um, there's a Python program. And the first thing I will say, and then the shout out to GitHub Copilot, I don't really know how to write Python code. <laughs> so uh, thanks to GitHub Copilot and quick starts that we have, um, I was able to put together uh, an example here. And uh, just to show you how relatively straightforward it is to get started, uh, using um, speech together with LLMs. Um, so, you know, the first thing you see here is, oh, no, da, 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 page up, um, is that I have my uh, speech configuration. Uh, I just uh, tell it uh, some stuff about like, um, um, you know, the, the region and I have a key um, so that I can actually use the service. And I'm gonna and I'm setting up a speech recognizer here. Um, that's all relatively straightforward. Uh, then I'm creating some events uh, to figure out, um, you know, when the recognizer actually returns information. Uh, yes. Uh, hopefully that's better to to see. Thank you. Um, and so um, the recognizer can return sort of two main events when it when it's recognizing speech. Um, the the recognizer I'm using here is is meant for real-time streaming recognition. So I'm streaming audio in, in this case from a microphone. And uh, there is the recognizing event. This is basically the event that happens whenever a word is recognized. Um, and then there's the recognized event. Uh, which um, is the one that happens when the recognizer sort of determines like the user is probably done speaking or at least makes a long enough pause. Um, and I realized I should be looking at this code instead. Uh, but so far, everything's kind of the same. Um, and so I have my setup here. Um, I have a voice that I can use to uh, speak things out. And uh, I have a connection to Azure OpenAI. Um, and I'm using the Assistance API in this, this case because it helps me keep uh, context from one turn to the next. And I have a prompt here. Uh, you have your helpful assistant. And it says here, since it's a spoken interaction, you should keep your responses brief. Um, and here's when we really get going. We'll play a greeting. And then we have a loop here 
that um, listens in on uh, the conversation. Um, when we have a result uh, of a recognition, then we will uh, take that and we will add it to a thread and, uh, in the assistant API. And then the assistant comes back and at the end we'll speak it out. So let's see what happens if we actually run this here. It takes a moment for it to get going and set everything up. Um, and then um, it should uh, go from there. <clears throat> this is the typical demo thing that happens when <laughs> it takes like- Hi, what can I help you with today? Hey, so can you tell me something about Seattle? Seattle is a city in the Pacific Northwest known for its beautiful scenery, coffee culture, tech industry, and vibrant music scene. Tell me a bit more about the coffee culture. Seattle has a strong coffee culture, with numerous local coffee shops and the presence of major chains like Starbucks. It's a hub for coffee enthusiasts and home to many skilled baristas. I'm done. All right. If you have any more questions in the future, feel free to ask. Have a great day. So um, that was pretty uh, straightforward and, and relatively easy um, to get going, of course. And I'm, you know, in this talk, I'm not really going to go into um, all the wonderful things that you have to worry about with like language, large language models and, and giving you the right answers. Um, and, and, and dealing with, with, with all that part. Um, but, um, you know, at least from a sort of first out of the box experience, it's, it's a relatively uh, quick thing uh, that you can, can get going with. Um, and, but we're not done yet. So, uh, so, so far that's nice, um, but maybe, I'm a company and I want to have my brand voice. Uh, for example, uh, we've, we've worked with Progressive, you know, probably Flo. Um, we created a custom voice uh, uh, based, on, based on her. And, um, you know, that's a, a, that's a pretty cool uh, capability. And, and in my mind also, you know, those kinds of things kind of fall into the larger range of, of, of generative AI as well. Um, uh, but it's also a powerful thing and a potentially a uh, bit dangerous kind of a thing if you can just copy somebody's voice. And so for that reason, it's a limited access feature. Um, you have to apply. Um, there's, uh, you know, some vetting that, that we do, um, and then we can give you access. Um, there, there is things that you can try out on our studio page, and I'll, I'll show you the studio in a, in a minute. Um, uh, e even without having access or being uh, uh, whitelisted, but we limit what you can do. So you can't just put any random text in. We'll have some text that you can, um, you know, that's sort of predetermined. Um, but it will help you sort of understand like how uh, how easy and 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 it is to create a custom voice, um, at least in, as a as a first a start, and uh, sort of what the quality of that is. And this kind of stuff you can do in, in our speech studio for which you see uh, here, um, the, um, you know, a, a screenshot of that. Um, so let's go back to our demo. Um, and let's see if I remember correctly, I have a voice up here and I just have to do the number one here. So if I put number one here, um, let's see what happens and whether you think you know what that voice is. I'm going to take a moment again to create the thing. I think the network connection is not like the fastest with the Zoom sharing. Oh, 
Oh, that is, of course. Let's try that. Uh, let's give it one more shot. <clears throat> um, if not, I will um, tell you what it should have happened. There we go. <laughs> Hi. What can I help you with today? Um, it's kind of weird talking to myself, but can you help me plan my day? Okay. Uh, this is... I'm here to help you with any questions, tasks, or information you need. Just let me know how I can assist you. I'm done. Oh, it's picking up its own, its own self here. Um, but um, so the um, I, I think I, I saw a message pop up here on my screen saying that the network connection was a little unstable. Uh, so, um, but you hopefully kind of heard that that was my voice. Uh, uh, that I created um, by recording um, a number of, of, of sentences. Um, I actually did this a, a little while ago, and at that time I had to record something like 500. We now have ways to do that with, with much less. Um, and there are also um, things that, we're, uh, that we've released called personal voice um, that you can actually do it just with one sort of um, sentence to, to get a to get a custom voice. Yeah. All right, let's go back to the presentation here. Um, the next thing is is okay. So having a nice voice is nice, but maybe you want to have a you know actual person kind of you you talk to, and so uh, you can actually do uh, this um, uh, TTS avatar. Um, here, and so if I, and so this is where, where I go to our speech studio. And I'm going to resume the session. Hopefully, this will work all right. Uh, needs a moment to load here, and it's kind of the same idea. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a large language model in, 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 on the back end, uh, but then I can, you know, ask her some stuff. Do you think oranges or bananas are better? It really depends on your personal taste, but I personally love both. And so uh, hopefully maybe through the Zoom connection, it's a little bit um, um, off, but um, you know, you have lip syncing of the, of the character here. She has you know, uh, some, some motion um, here that you can do. Uh, and there are some other things that are kind of uh, um, interesting uh, here too. Is this, um, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is um, for some of the voices that we have, we have different speaking styles. So you can see there's uh, things like whispering and, 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 and other stuff here. And uh, also through large language model use, you can then try to see if you can sort of predict how she's supposed to respond. Uh, and so let's see if this works. Can you whisper? Certainly, I can whisper. Is there anything you'd like me to say in a whisper? Um, so there, there, there are things like that. So depending on sort of the, the text, um, it can uh, apply the appropriate sort of um, style um, to the to the voice. All right. Um, with that, we're just going to go back right here. And sorry, not this one. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to move into the next part of this, um, which is uh, the speech analytics thing. Um, and this is, you know, really about gaining insights into um, conversations. 
Um, there's in our AI studio, I, I have a link to it um, later. There's a, there's a tryout that we have. It's uh, some pre-canned examples uh, right now. We have a, a, a private preview of, of uh, uh, this that, that um, you, people can sign up for uh, and, and try out. But um, the idea behind it is really to get, um, you know, you, you create the transcript either in real time as the conversation is unfolding um, or offline and, you know, through, through batch transcription or offline transcription um, after the fact. Uh, and then once you have that uh, transcript, you can then do, uh, you know, gain insights in, into that conversation. So um, it's probably too small here, but in this example here, there is a summary of the conversation. You have the transcript, you have the different speakers, uh, you have sentiment. Um, and you have various uh, things like um, key entities and topics that have, that have been discussed uh, that have been extracted from this. And so here are some example scenarios of, of uh, where this is uh, um, very interesting. Um, in particular, in the call center uh, space, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, there's a you know, fair bit of that we've already been doing for, for a while of so-called post-call analytics. So this is after a call center agent had a conversation with a um, caller, um, you know, taking that recording and um, getting insights. And these insights can help you understand like, you know, what, what are the problems that customers are asking about? Uh, um, or, you know, how is the agent doing when they're interacting with the customer? And historically it's been, um, that, you know, and, and, and a supervisor uh, for a call center agent would sort of maybe listen into a call or they would screen a small percentage of, of calls to sort of get an understanding of how things are going. But with this solution, you can really um, do that across all of the calls that are happening in the call center. And you can get a better understanding of, um, you know, areas maybe where an agent is struggling. Um, uh, to provide the right answer and you can see how you know you can help them with training or maybe um, even say like maybe this agent is good for these kinds of answers and we can maybe route those kinds of things to him and here's somebody who's more specialized in this other area and we use you we use them for that um but um also increasingly uh, we're seeing um, customers look for what we call real-time agent assist and here it's basically in real time um, doing the recognition um, of the conversation, both sides, the uh, call center agent and the user, and then providing guidance information to the call center agent uh, so they can um, you know, have a better answer for their customer. Uh, they can more quickly resolve the issue. And there are also some tasks that call center agents do after the call. So, um, for example, they often have to, or, or typically have to provide notes on like, you know, what was this call about? And a lot of that, you know, can be automated and can be made faster and, and where they just have to do a re review and you can also get more consistency uh, in, in that, that information. Um, and so um, that's, that's another um, scenario. Then there's sort of a broad sense, uh, set of, you know, all kinds of audio and video content, right? And um, it can start from sort of quote unquote simple, you know, providing captions and subtitles, so translated captions. Um, there's also um, work in automated, automated video dubbing. Uh, so actually, um, you know, replacing the talk track with an automated, uh, uh, voice, um, you know, summarizing the content of, uh, uh, of a video. So you have these talks, you know, you can, you can create a summary so when you post them, you know, you know, what, what was being talked about or automatic chaptering, um, of, of, of content. And, you know, there, there are lots of, um, other things, um, you know, that, that you can envision. And the nice thing about, large language models is that you have, you know, the ability to shape your prompt and get sort of the, the an analytics out of it um, that, you're, that you're looking for. And then of course meetings, 
um, have, have similar things. Um, the teams uh, co-pilot um, now not only creates a transcript, but you know can create like a, a meeting summary with action items, and um, also has a nice feature where if you come a little late to a meeting, you can tell it, ask it to catch you up, and then gives you a quick summary of, of what was talked about. Uh, that assumes that somebody actually turned on the recording, <laughs> and so. Um, but uh, so those are pretty pretty useful um, examples. There are more. There's there there you know there's there's quite a broad range. But um, I wanted to show this kind of uh, video here um, that also talks a little bit uh, about this whole thing. Speech analytics is a new Azure AI capability, which helps customers generate deep insights into their audio or video based content with OpenAI and other services for both real time and batch scenarios, such as video analysis and captioning, game chat moderation, and customer service insights. Here is an example for batch processing workloads, where speech analytics helped create insights into customer service recordings. Now let's see a real time scenario where speech analytics helped create an agent assist solution using speech, open AI, and language services to extract helpful information from a call in real time. We separate speakers using the real-time diarization rization feature of the speech service, track sentiment using language service, and extract speaker names, topic, and relevant questions detected by Azure OpenAI's large language models. You can try an early preview of speech analytics through the new Azure AI Studio experience. Go to speech, speech analytics, check out the scenario templates, and the analytic results. To learn more, sign up for our private preview waitlist. Speech analyst. So um, here's a short diagram of you know what it is that we have um, currently. Um, so the, the the basic idea is is that this is for sort of offline transcription of content. Um, once you have set this up uh, through an um, setup that you know, uh, you can either do through a, a script or, or an API um, or through our studio, you can uh, drop uh, audio files into a storage location you've specified. Um, we automatically determine that there's new files there. Um, we then have our uh, speech service do the transcription. Uh, once you have that uh, transcribed data, uh, we can then use things like a prompt flow um, uh, based uh, um, um, yeah, thing uh, together with Azure OpenAI or language uh, service-based analytics to you know extract information uh, from that transcript, and then we can write this back into storage um, as a as a JSON file that you can then parse and get all the analytics results out of that and then use it for any kind of downstream process um, you, you want to use from, the, from there. And um, I'm gonna be brave and I'm gonna try and do another demo because, oh, that was the wrong key. <laughs> uh, there we go. And so, I basically used a very similar um, set of Python code to try and see if I can uh, uh, do some real-time analytics here right in front of you. So hopefully this will run a little faster than the last, last thing. And hopefully it's all good. Um, and so it's, you know, once it is uh, going and, and set up, it will, um, basically listen to the speech as it's, as it's happening. And then it will start uh, recognizing what is happening here. So as I'm talking, um, I can sort of describe that we're using speech plus uh, large language models 
um, to recognize uh, audio uh, from somebody that is uh, speaking here, and then the large language model to do the analytics. And so with that, uh, what you will see next is, is that I have some analytics results on the sentiment and then what kind of topics were discussed. Uh, and that's the result that happens on a sort of regular basis um, as I'm speaking. And so here we will have another result. And I'm kind of sad that I'm going to be reaching the end of my talk here pretty soon. So let's see if uh, uh, what happens then. And so the sentiment was negative because I'm sad. Uh, but I'm also excited that I had a chance to talk to you today um, and uh, you know, got to share some of these things with you. And with that, I'm gonna stop it. And then there's just one last uh, step that it does. Uh, once it sort of stopped everything, um, it will go over the conversation and it will create a summary of this. Um, again, using the same uh, large language model. And with that, we can go back here. Yeah, a couple of links here. Uh, one is to our speech studio. Um, the speech studio has, um, and you don't have to sign in uh, to sort of see what's what's there. Um, it has um, um, tryouts for various capabilities. So if you want to use our speech recognition, uh, there's some some easy way for you to to try um, those out, or the text to speech side as well. You can listen to our voices. Um, and this is also the place where if you wanted to like customize things like create a custom new voice or a custom speech model, you can do that as well. And then the other thing I have is the link to our uh, speech analytics um, tryout here. And with that, I'm at the end and go to QA. Uh, we need somebody with the mic. Yeah. I think. Uh, there was one uh, right here in front. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that talk. I have a question about the um, Edge. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that some of these uh, services can be run on Edge. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any offline support for um, some of these APIs, especially the first demo that you had with the uh, chat. Uh, it would have been know... good to have something that was that ran offline given the network. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we do have a solution uh, for an, an embedded speech recognition uh, engine. Um, uh, it is something that um, you sort of need to apply uh, to, to get access to, but um, um, yeah, for, for and, and we sort of kind of also there vet the uh, sort of the use case. But, um, and, it, and you can use that also in combination with like the cloud service. So, um, you know, you, you, you basically do it on the device, but you also do it in the cloud. Um, and if you get the result back from the cloud, um, because it can run a somewhat larger model there, even though the embedded recognizer is actually quite good and pretty close to what you get in the cloud. Um, you know, you can then decide which which result you you want to use, or when you're completely offline, obviously you would just use the local result. Or if the cloud result doesn't come fast enough, like happened here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Super fascinating talk. Um, so I'm assuming the uh, sentiment is modeled based on the text. But yeah, I, I did nothing fancy here in the sense that I, all I did is, is in my prompt, I told it that, uh, tell me the sentiment for the, you know, for the sentence. Uh, and I gave it three options, neutral, positive, and negative. Are you aware of any efforts underway to try to model sentiment based on intonation rather than just the, the text? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, it is something that we're 
we're, we're looking at, um, it's, it's a little tricky um, um, to do that um, and definitely needs to be something that you do in conjunction with like text-based um, sentiment analysis. Um, and sort of an, an, another interesting thing around it is it's like, you know, you have to be a little bit careful and, and this is why I used like negative, neutral and positive um, sort of what emotions you're ascribing to the user. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly something that, um, that we're looking at. Hi. Nothing public yet though. <laughs> awesome demo. Um, I'm interested in natural conversations and the statistics of uh, when people cut each other off or talk over each other in conversation. So the ability to have uh, transcripts coming out in real time from multi-party conversations is amazing. I was wondering, are your transcripts able to track uh, like fine time scale, multiple party uh, tokens like that or? Yes, you can, yeah, you can get uh, in our detailed speech recognition result, um, you will see timestamps for the beginning and end of each individual word or entire, you know, or, or sentences or or segments rather, sentences. Mul could be multiple sentences. I mean, uh, okay. yeah, absolutely. Oh, hi, um, my name is Hao. Um, I have a question about uh, the speech analyzer at the, at the end of your uh, uh, speech. Because mm -hmm. uh, at the middle, there, there's our tar can is able to change the tones, right? Yes. Different tone. So, uh, with the speech analyze, can you like analyze people's like uh, the way that people speech or their tone to to like analyze how they're thinking or how they're like, to to a degree, yeah. I mean, so and there are actually kind of two different things. A, a plug for our language service too. So there's we have a, a language service that does um, text analytics, and as part of that, it can do sentiment analysis. But as I said, it, it, it's typically like, you know, positive, neutral or negative kind of sentiment. Um, you can, but, you know, in my case, what I did is, is I asked, uh, you know, a GPT 3.5 turbo model to just look at the sentence and give me the sentiment. Um, and you can decide what it is that you, you know, what kind of sentiment it should choose be between. I, I chose ne neutral uh, positive and negative, but you know, you might use something else, but you also have to be a little careful that, that you actually get a, get a good result, like with anything, <laughs> uh, with large language models. Hi, um, I was wondering how much the latency can be optimized to where it starts to seem, you know, more like a real conversation of, <clears throat> I've seen this, uh, you know, used in several applications and, and even in the demo. If there's a three second pause, it's a lot different than, you know, like a half second pause. Yeah, um, that's actually um, uh, one of the, so in, in, in general, um, uh, one of the points I actually meant to make is this, um, there is a difference between you putting uh, sort of a speech input output system in front of a, a chat interaction or, or, or a, you know, chat GPT model or, or, or similar uh, versus it actually being a chat interaction. Because we're all, this chat, we're all used to like, you know, I've read, sent somebody a text, you know, maybe they answer right away, maybe they don't, I don't really know. Um, and we have more tolerance there for the speed. Um, in, the, in the speech case, yeah, if, if you say something and nothing happens for a few seconds, then people go like, did it hear me? What happened? Um, and also you have sort of an expectation of like how quickly things come back. Um, I didn't do anything like super fancy in this um, case. Um, there are certainly things that you could consider doing. Um, you can get these sort of recognizing events as the words are being spoken. Um, you could imagine doing some speculative kind of decision to send something to, you know, the GPT model. Um, so you kind of uh, cut off some of the latency because you know, we have to wait a little bit. You have to make some kind of determination, like the person is done speaking. 
And since we can't see the person and we just have to do it on the voice, there's, you know, we basically have to wait for a certain amount of pause um, at least. Um, and so you can recover some of that um, latency potentially, but it comes at a cost, right? You might have to run, you might run speculative a, 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 a thing to GPT and then it comes back and then you go like, oh, actually the person wasn't done speaking. So I need to just ignore that. And then you have to do it again. Um, but yeah, those are kinds of, you know, there, there are things like that um, that you can, you could do uh, to, to make it faster. And yeah, get half a second is too fast, actually. Um, people don't like it when people respond too quickly. <laughs> um, the other thing that I will say um, is, um, depending, you know, there might be situations where there's just no way you can get the thing back quickly, quickly enough. You need to make a, you know, call to some database or, you know, you have some other stuff that you need to do. Um, and if, especially if that's not something that happens a lot, you can also think about doing fillers, right? Uh, and sort of trying to bridge the gap. At least you acknowledge that you heard something and then it gives you a little bit, you know, humans do this too, right? We go and say like, hmm, let me think about that. Oh, interesting question. <laughs> what I would do <laughs> is this, right? Um, so, but you can't do it with everything. Um, I, I was actually sort of playing around with it a little bit where, uh, but I wasn't trying to do anything too clever um, and where I just said like, huh, interesting. And then I played the, while while I was doing the LLM thing, um, but it got sort of repetitive, so I, I, I took it out of my code. Hi, thank you for the great demo. Uh, so you mentioned three. It needs to be green. <laughs> the microphone has network problems too, apparently. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, so you mentioned three primary sentiments, neutral, positive, negative. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know, can it identify sarcasm? <laughs> <laughs> can, you can you identify sarcasm? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> test, test. Um, I think it's tricky. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I do think that ultimately um, there should be some way of, of, of detecting that. Um, the, what I was using, no, because it was based on the, uh, uh, purely on the text. So it was not, you, you do have to have the audio signal um, there. And yes, the hope would be that if you combine the audio plus, you know, the information that you're getting from the, from the text, if you combine those two, that, that you would be able to catch those. Um, but I would say not humans aren't also, also aren't really that great at detecting sarcasm sometimes. So your mileage may vary. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Uh, by the way, my question was more around like uh, custom avatars. Uh, and if that is a possibility with the current feature, and how does like the lip sync feature work here? Uh, great question. So yes, we have the ability to do custom avatars. Um, just like with custom voice, it is a limited access feature you have to apply for and tell us what you're wanting to do because, you know, copying people, copying voices, not like, you know, have to be careful. Um, um, and, and so there, and, and then we can sort of, help um, uh, uh, create that and, and we'll, you know, we'll continue to, to work on, on, on making that easier. Um, and the lip syncing thing is uh, basically, uh, there is a feature in just the standard uh, uh, speech to text output uh, that provides, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name now. Um, information on basically lip, lip position of iZemes. There we go. Um, and, and so, you know, with that, 
uh, and the timing information that you that you get that you can get from the from the uh, text to speech, um, you're then able to create that sort of um, synchronization. So you could also have like a you know th 3D animated uh, character or something like that, and use the Visemes to uh, do the lip, lip syncing. So that's that's basically how that works. Hey there, uh, this is Michael. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, you know, make the presentation. Uh, I have a newbie question, probably. Uh, I saw your demo in the real time analysis, mm -hmm. and I saw your output. Basically, every single word, mm -hmm. you just output, you know, the sentence right as the word grows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes it basically give me the impression that you are using a uh, like recurrent neural network behind the curtain, uh, which is very different from the LS uh, you know, LSTM or you know, the the transformer based uh, GPT models. So I just wonder what exactly the model behind the curtain and what's the reasoning of using that. Yeah, so um, great question. So the, yes, it is, um, um, it, it, it is sort of that style of model. It's, it's, a, it's a model that can take streaming input so you can feed it, you know, little bits of audio and it will continue to um, do the, um, you know, recognition and keep adding more words. And so if you really have a, you know, a streaming kind of situation, like you want to do real-time captions on a meeting, for example, you really need something like that to be able to quickly uh, produce the words as, as they're spoken. Uh, and in contrast to like Whisper, for example, which is a transformer model where, you know, it's designed to take a whole chunk of audio, you can give it a little chunk of audio, but it gets sort of tricky <laughs> if you, you know, have to do it a lot. But you know the idea is, is you give a whole chunk of audio and then it is quick to return your text. Um, but you know it's not really you can't just add a little bit more audio and get you know the next word or something like that. Uh, so yeah, that's why on our side currently the implementation that we have in our speech service, where if you want to use Whisper, we use that for the offline transcription of of, of audio files. It's not something that you can use for like the real-time um, API that I was using here. There's somebody over here or, or back there. Yeah, let's go back. Go ahead. First. <laughs> go ahead in the blue jacket. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. It was really nice. Um, I'm taking a customer's view and customer's view. Mm -hmm. And you know, also looking at all the different questions that everybody is asking. Almost everybody's requirement is: can it detect sarcasm? Can it detect the you know intonation? A lot of things, right? If you look at how the industry, how we evolved over years, uh, once certain things are a kind of standard, we we throw out a standard format out there, right? For example, if there's an audio file, right? MP3 came out as a standard, and MP4 came out as a standard for video, which which has had a lot of basic things, right? Mm -hmm. So as I'm listening to everybody, uh, you know, what everybody is saying, I think it's high time to get to something that standardize a lot of these things um, into a format um, that's interchangeable across vendors. Because if, if I'm, a, let's say, if I'm a call center and if I try to go into all this infrastructure and build something, and at some point, you know, if I have to switch something, then everything will be totally useless for me because, you know, it's it's, it's somebody's interpretation using their own set of LLMs, right? So just an observation thought, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, Thank, thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how things evolve um, over time. I mean, there's certainly a room for some level of standardization. Um, yeah, I have one question. Uh, what are the configurations you have to do before running this? Uh, real-time analysis, like, do you need to set up how many uh, users are there in the room or like what language it is uh, running in? Can it support multi-languages, like multiple languages? Uh, yeah, uh, great question. So um, um, there are a couple of different features that you can, that I didn't use here, but that you can add. Um, 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 if you have a single audio stream, but you have like multiple speakers, uh, we have a speaker diarization capability that can um, sort of, you know, identify, you know, this thing was said by speaker one, this next section was said by speaker two, then it's speaker one again, then it's speaker three. Um, so uh, that is one option. Um, if you have two people on a call, 
ideally you have them on separate sort of audio streams because you know it's still hard to sort of figure out when people talk over each other which can happen um you know what you should do and and there's also no ambiguity really who is saying what um if, if you have have two channels um we have things like meeting devices that have like you know microphone arrays and there are things that you can do there also to try to separate speakers and and and, and things like that um but then you know you're sort of getting to the point of of, or you have a Teams meeting with lots of people online, you have to think about like, you know, how to sort of separately transcribe them, but in an efficient way. So you probably don't want to transcribe every single one of them because mo most of the time only one person is talking. But, you know, um, uh, so so that, that would be something that you would have to set up if you have, you know, those kinds of uh, situations. Um, the other thing is language um, ID. Um, so we have a language ID capability. You can say here, you know, up to 10 languages, um, but languages, uh, so, you know, German, English, uh, you, we can't distinguish between like flavors of English. Um, and you can do, and then you do speech recognition and, you know, you can switch the language um, but, uh, along the way. Um, we also recently added some bilingual models so a model that can recognize both English and Spanish for, for the US, for example, or uh, English and uh, French for Canada. Uh, and that is a singular model that recognizes both languages and sort of automatically figures it out. And you can you know, just mix in some French term in the middle of an English sentence and, and, and it works well. Um, and Whisper itself is also, you know, can do a bunch of different languages as, as, as well and so i think there's you know certainly is going to be more of that kind of um, uh, stuff happening um, as well all right thank you. very good thank you so much hi guys uh five minutes break uh, before the next speaker. Okay.
Hello, hello, hello. Hello? There seems to be quite a bit of echo. Yeah, I want this one, but this one, this one's, um, yeah, 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 but there's, there's a lot of echo. Is there, oh, should I? Hello? Oh, okay, that's probably better. All right, hello, everybody. Oh, hey. Yes, I recognize quite a few people in this crowd. Um, how many of you guys have not seen me before? Oh, quite a few. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. I'm not nearly as famous as I thought I was. All right. Well, uh, in that case, I will give you a quick introduction to myself. My name is Eugen Tang. Um, I currently work as a developer advocate at Zillis. And today my talk is titled Vector Embeddings Are All You Need. And it's titled after this because of, oh, who's familiar with the paper, the Transformers paper? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you guys are totally familiar with these titles. So yeah, vector embeddings are all you need. Okay. We're having technical issues. Oh, here we go. Okay. So why should you care about AI? Uh, so first of all, it should be why should you care about AI, but not why should you care AI? So I've got this great uh, GIF. If you pronounce a GIF, you're wrong. I've got this great GIF of Idris Elba here, and uh, this is the reaction when people. Do you guys see that Sam uh, Sam Altman is raising seven trillion dollars for AI? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? So um, you can see he's saying, "Holy shit!" All right. So for this talk, the takeaways that I want you to get from this talk, I should have put this slide at the end as well. But at the beginning, the takeaways I want you to get from this talk are. Vector embeddings are critical to LLM apps and that you should have context-specific embeddings models. Who knows what an embeddings model is? Just a few people. Great. You guys are in for a good, uh, a good ride today. So the plan today is I'm going to give you an introduction to the LLM stack. I'm going to cover six sets of tools. So they're actually, I'll be updating this. Uh, it's based on an article that I wrote last month, and I'll be updating it this month because I had a lot of people reach out to me and tell me I was missing their tools. But... Uh, you guys are going to see the ones that I did get to know of. And there's about 52 tools in here, so um, it'll be fun. And then I'm going to talk about understanding vector embeddings a little bit. You'll get some visualizations. It'll be a little interactive. You'll get to learn what it's like to, to be an embeddings model, to be a vector database. And then I'll point you to some uh, further learnings. So first of all, let's get an introduction to the LLM stack. That QR code right there. Uh, if you would like to uh, take your phones out and scan that QR code, um, that will take you to an article that I wrote uh, last month that basically has this picture as the uh, you know the cover picture of it. And it covers all six of these categories. And I've been told that there's actually a seventh category that I should add called infrastructure. Uh, and uh, maybe that I should separate out some of the LLMs from strict LLMs to LLM providers. Um, but anyway, um, we're going to cover all six of these categories. So don't worry if uh, you didn't get the scan the QR code. So the first thing we're going to cover is vector databases. And as you can see, I've got this circle around this first one up in that corner there with a lot of arrows pointed at it. That vector database is Milvis, and the reason why there's a lot of arrows points at it and there's a circle around it is because that is what I work on. As you can see, that logo is also on my shirt. So Milvis is a vector database. It is a distributed vector database, and as far as I'm aware, it is the only distributed vector database. And what that means is that it's very, very good for enterprise-scale applications. So if you are working with applications with hundreds of millions to billions of vectors, this would be your vector database of choice. Now, there are many other vector data. Preferred camera is disconnected. OK. Uh, looks like it's fine. Um, now, there are many other vector databases. I won't cover all the vector databases on here, but I will cover some of them. So uh, let's, let's just go across the board. So this one here, this is Weavy8. Who's heard of Weavy8? OK, a couple of people. So this one here, this is Chroma. Who's heard of Chroma? Oh, quite a few more people. Wow, OK. And this one here is Quadrant. Who's heard of Quadrant? OK, and um, yeah, none of the rest are important. Oh, actually, there's one more important one. Sorry. So uh, this one right here, this is Zillis. Who's heard of Zillis? Uh, OK, who knows that Zillis and Milvis are actually the same product? 
Ah, just a few people. Okay, yes, those rest of them are unimportant. Okay, so then there's uh, embeddings models. So embeddings are actually, this is what this talk is about. This talk is about vector embeddings. So there's actually not really a lot of companies working on vector embeddings. I don't know why. Um, I think there should be more companies working on vector embeddings. Um, but there is one uh, that is pretty, that has come out recently with, with a bunch of really good embedding models called Voyage AI. So it's run by some guy out of Stanford. Uh, and then there's Bento ML. So Bento ML, who's heard of Bento ML? Okay, yeah, they're like a pretty small company, but they do a lot of embeddings. I also have them in the LLM slide because they also provide LLMs. And then who knows what this one here on the bottom is, right? Everybody knows what that one is, right? Hugging Face, yeah, okay. Hugging Face is great. They got a lot of open AI, uh, sorry, open source uh, models and things like that. And um, I use Hugging Face quite a lot. Okay, so then there's also the stack of data tools. And I've actually been told that uh, maybe I should separate these out too, because there's many, many categories of data tools. So let's cover some of these categories of data tools. Um, so these first two here, uh, these two right here, uh, are more or less, I would say, uh, data uh, observability kind of tools. So one is Voxel 51 or uh, voxel, whatever. And then the other one is Galileo. And what they do is they kind of show you how your data looks and, uh, compares different and allows you to compare different data points. And then up here we have DVC and ZHub. And so DVC and ZHub are ways to do version control on your data. So you guys are familiar with GitHub, right? Who's familiar with GitHub? Okay, yeah, most people here are familiar with GitHub. So you can think of GitHub as version control for your code. These guys are version control for your data. Um, and then there's a few on here. So ByteWax is down there. They did a talk uh, at one of my events last month. Um, and so they're a streaming, uh, data streaming platform. Um, let's see what else is important on here. So Kafka, uh, you guys, who's heard of Kafka? Great, I don't have to explain Kafka. Uh, what about... Uh, this logo here, who knows what this logo here is? A few people, okay. Wow, Databricks is also not as famous as I thought it would be. Um, but that one's Databricks. And who knows which one of these tools Databricks is built on? Yeah, okay, yeah. So then there's Spark down there. So Databricks is built on Spark. And then there's um, you know, Airbyte, Unstructured. They're both ways to pipe data. And Pulsar, which is a competitor to Kafka. Um, okay, so there's some orchestration frameworks. Um, Okay, who recognizes that orchestration framework with the llama? Yeah, yeah. Who was at my hackathon this last weekend? Yes, you guys got to use llama index. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, what about the one next to llama index? The one with the the parrot and the link, parrot link, parrot link, guys. It's called parrot link. Okay, so Langchain is there. Um, Langchain is the most popular framework in this entire stack. Um, and then who's who knows that this one is over here with the green one? Haystack. Yes, who said that? Ah, yes, this guy. He knows everything. Okay. Uh, what about this one here? Oh, you're just reading that off the slide, man. All right, so that's Semantic Kernel. Um, and then uh, what about that one below Langchain? Who knows about that one? Uh, uh, okay, that's Flight. Um, so that's Sage's company. Where is Sage? Sage, are you in here? Oh, he's outside. Okay, that's the company that Sage works for. He'll talk to you more about it. Uh, Flowwise is a kind of drag and drop LLM rag app kind of thing. And uh, who's seen this one? Yeah, none of you have. You seen this one? Oh, dang. Okay, so someone has seen that one. Okay, so that's Boundary ML. They're based out of Seattle. Uh, they're actually in uh, Cap Hill, and they're doing. Um, let's say a different approach than LangChain. It's pretty interesting. They're doing a more um, how would I describe this structured approach? I mean, uh, a, a less, a more deterministic approach, a less statistical approach to the way these things work. Um, and they were actually also at the hackathon. Um, so yeah, these are some of the orchestration frameworks. And the next step, we'll look at quality tuning frameworks. So who knows about this this one? This little like one way over there. The pink one. Okay, no one knows any of these tools. That's great. So that's Arise. So Arise is, uh, an, you can also kind of think them think of them as related to the uh, data as well. They let you visualize some data um, using, guess what? Vector embeddings. Uh, who's heard of Y Labs? They're based out of Seattle. Sage has given some talks about them. So 
Uh, if he were here, I would tell him that he needed to do a better job at his time at Y Labs because only three of you had heard of it. Uh, what about Trera? Who's heard of Trera? Okay, a few of you guys know about Trera. Okay, what about that one way over? What is this camera doing? All right. Uh, what about this one right here? Who knows this one? No one? Aporia? No one knows Aporia? Okay. Uh, none of these, I mean, it's not the, none of them are important. I just can't remember their names. Um, okay. These are probably the ones that you guys know most of. I bet most people here know many of the LLMs and servers. So that first link in the top right, who knows that? Who knows that logo? You, you, guys, you guys are messing with me. You guys don't know OpenAI? You guys are pulling my leg here, dude. That's OpenAI, okay? Everyone knows OpenAI. Um, what about the one below OpenAI? OctoAI, yes. Okay, they're also based out of Seattle. I have an event with them on March 14th. We're going to have Pi. You guys should come. Um, the one below OctoAI is Desi. So Desi has re released a bunch of 7 million parameter models as well as some of the bigger ones. Um, they're pretty interesting. Uh, the one about the one next to OpenAI. The one next to OpenAI, Llama, yes. Meta, Llama, yes. Great, great. So we've already covered Bento ML. Someone already shouted Cohere. Cohere is the one next to Desi. Uh, next to Cohere, there's AI Blocks. So they were, um, they were also a sponsor at the last hackathon. They um, build these very, very small models that are very, very tuned to RAG and also very tuned to finance and legal. Um, so not a great fit for AI agents. What about the one above AI Blocks? Yeah, Hugging Face. OK, this is the second time Hugging Face has come up on this. Um, you can tell I really like them. Uh, and then Gemini. So has anyone gotten to play around Gemini yet? A couple of you guys have gotten to play around Gemini. OK, well, I haven't been able to play around this, so hook me up. Um, next to Gemini is uh, Bedrock. So Bedrock is a way that you can pipe these kinds of uh, you know LMs around. And then below Bedrock is, um, I'm sure most of you guys know Mixtral, right? Everyone's heard of Mixtral now. It's quite quite popular. Uh, and below that is Anthropic, and they released Claude 3 yesterday, uh, and that was a, you know, a big announcement, a surprise announcement, kind of like Beyonce's like, surprise album drop. It was really big. Okay, so let's understand vector embeddings. This whole talk is about vector embeddings, and I've spent quite a bit of time just talking about pieces of the LLM stack. So I've got some uh, pictures and uh, videos from uh, Voxel51. Uh, and so what I actually want you to, what I want to point you guys to is this little set of, this little image here, okay? So you guys see that there's a lot of these kinds of, let's say, blobs of data around, right? And so these little blobs of data are represent, these little clusters, clusters is what they're called. These clusters represent uh, different categories. And what you can see from this is that the vector embeddings of the images that are on the right-hand side, Right hand side. Yes, the left hand side of the screen for you guys. Um, anyway, the images of the numbers correspond to where they sit in these clusters. So vector embeddings of these numbers are all can all be represented in this space. Now, typically, you would never really see vector embeddings represented in three dimensional space, right? So. This is a screenshot, so that's two dimensions, but if you were to play around with it in the application, it is a three-dimensional space, and you can move it around and look at how these clusters interact with each other. Now, what that essentially should show you is that vector embeddings mm, represent the relationships between these images, okay? So now let's look at a couple other vector embeddings. So, Earlier, earlier, I said that vector embeddings are context specific. They are specific to the context they are of the data they're trained on. And what they do is they tell you about how related pieces of data are. So I'm about to show you three different searches conducted on the CIFAR, CIFAR, I have no idea how to pronounce this, CIFAR 10 data set. So this data set has 10 categories of non-overlapping images. This data set contains airplanes, automobiles, birds, cats, deer, dogs, frogs, horses, ships, and trucks. Who thinks that there is a good amount of overlap between these categories? 
Okay, some people think there's a good amount of overlap. Okay, a few people. Okay, most of you guys don't think there's too big of an overlap. So what I actually want to show you is that um, even though there's not a huge overlap between these categories, there are still ways that your model, and in this case, we use a multimodal model, clip fit, that your model can confuse these categories. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So first, we're going to search up the word Ferrari. And we're going to see that when we search Ferrari, we get a bunch of pictures of nice cars. I don't know if all of these are Ferraris, but you know, a bunch of these are cars, right? So Ferraris are clearly cars. Next, we're going to search up the word pony. So we get a bunch of pictures of horses. And ponies are clearly horses. But what if we search up the word Mustang? Do we get cars? Do we get horses? Oh, it looks like we get both. And the reason for this is because there's a car called a Mustang, and there are also horses that are referred to as Mustangs. And what I want you to take away from this, this uh, example, essentially, is that this context, the context that you are searching in, is incredibly important for the results that you're going to get back. And if you have a data set like this, and you're looking for cars, and you look for Mustangs, and you get horses back, you're going to be disappointed. And if you're looking for animals, and you get cars back when you search up Mustang, you're going to be disappointed. So it's very, very important that you use a model that has the right context for the types of data that you're working with. OK, so now we're going to be a vector database. So I, I really like these interactive things you guys can tell. So um, I've got three sentences on the screen. Apple made profits of $97 billion in 2023. Insane. Uh, I like to eat apple pie for profit in 2023. I really should have put 2024, because I will also do that in 2024. If you want to pay me to eat apple pie, I will do it. Um, and Apple's bottom line increased by record numbers in 2023. So. Um, which two sentences are the most, oh, let's, let, let me ask the question. Which one of these sentences doesn't make sense? Is it the first one? No, the first one seems, everyone seems to think that makes sense. What about the second one? Raise your hand if you think the second one is the one that comes out. Okay. What about the third one? Okay, so one guy thinks the third one comes out. So actually, that's a very good point because you know what? If I look for the word profit, I would get back the first two sentences. So that is the traditional way that we've done search. We've done keyword search. And if I were to just look for the word profit, then I would get back the first two sentences. And that's not what I actually want to get back, right? If I want to say, like, tell me about how Apple did in 2023, I would want just the first and the third one. And actually, if I said Apple, then I would get back all three. Um, but notice that, you know, despite the fact that we use different wording, the third one and the first one actually make sense to all of you as the ones, the two that make the most sense. And so, the way that this is dictated is based on the embedding model that you have that generates how close these vector embeddings will be that generates the relationships between these words and these sentences. And it will also weight those relationships based on the data that you give it. So vector embeddings will, uh, vector databases will return, will search for these sentences and vector embeddings are what create, vector, oh, sorry, embedding models are what create the vector embeddings that dictate the relationship between these sentences. OK, so I have another fun one. Which one is the fake Taylor Swift? So you guys who have seen me give talks before, you guys know that I love Taylor Swift. Um, so who thinks that the first picture, this, this one, who thinks that that one is uh, the fake Taylor Swift? Everyone knows that's the real Taylor Swift. OK, what about the second one? Some of you guys think the second one is the fake Taylor Swift. What about the third one? Who thinks the third one is the fake Taylor Swift? OK, who's not voting? <laughs> All right. So clearly, some of you guys here are afraid that I'm going to judge you, but I'm really not going to remember who voted for what. Uh, the second one is the fake Taylor Swift. Now, I think the third one looks a little bit weird, um, but that's because it's flipped. Uh, so, But it is, it is the real Taylor Swift, so I'd like to Thank you out for helping me out with this um, audience member over there. OK, so that pretty much, oh, this is the real Taylor Swift, by the way. You know, just, just so you guys know, none of those pictures before were actually Taylor Swift. This is, this is it. OK, so that's pretty much it for my talk. I hope that you guys got the, got the gist of it. You know, context, extremely, extremely important. And um, 
yeah, you should have context specific embedding models. If you want to keep up with my events, I run hackathons uh, and I don't really do tech talks, but tech talks too much, but I do workshops. I do some tech talks and I run hackathons. I run this community called Open Source Software for AI. I also help out running the AI camp community. So some of you, that's why I asked if some of you guys have seen them before. And if you would like to keep up with me, um, there's a picture of me. That's what my LinkedIn profile picture looks like. Uh, and that QR code there will direct you to my LinkedIn and you can uh, send me a connection request or follow me or whatever. Um, okay. Uh, what time is it? Oh, wow. Okay. So I pretty much planned for this to be 730 on the dot. So, you know, um, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Nick. Which which one? Uh, this slide. The next slide. The slide. The next slide. This slide. Uh, apparently, in between those two slides, you said important things. The crux of your talk was like these are all very similar, right? Apple, Apple, Apple. Only two profits. And you said vector embeddings are important. Oh, because oh, of oh, oh, this oh. Reason. Oh, sorry, sorry. This slide. No, apparently. No. Vector and, yet, was, and yet that wasn't the slide I was thinking of. Uh, mm. I didn't this think slide. it was going to be this difficult to, to sort of. Yeah, the Apple's profit slide. You're like, this, this is a problem and we can get around this problem by using. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I just want to show you this is a problem. Oh, okay. You there's actually not very, there's actually not a lot of good solutions that exist for this on the market. You just okay. have to fine tune your own embedding models right now. Okay, dope. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could you could uh you could fund my next startup, which is gonna solve that problem. How much pie will you eat for that funding? Um I will eat uh I'll eat one slice of pie for every million dollars that I raise. I need to make <laughs> smaller pies. <laughs> yes, uh any other questions? Yes, Muriel. I'm curious about the difference between um, vector embeddings for words versus sentences and how complex it is to go from just sim getting similar words to similar sentences. Yeah, so um, if you are familiar with uh, the way that natural language processing worked prior to transformers, um, we typically worked with these things called uh, in, uh, one hot embeddings or uh, TF IDF, which is. Um, term frequency inverse document frequency, which would give you different embeddings based on how often they appeared in a sentence and versus how often they appeared in a document. Um, and those were, let's say, algorithmic ways to get vector embeddings. And now what we typically do is we actually use um, deep learning models to get vector embeddings. And so we no longer typically work with uh, sparse embeddings, such as the ones generated by one hot encodings, um, but rather we work with dense embeddings, which are a bunch of um, float numbers. And typically there's hundreds of numbers that will represent one embedding. And you can actually use a word or a sentence and it will generate an embedding that represents whatever you know, the word or sentence that you put in is, it does not matter. Um, but now, you know, prior, what we now refer to as traditional ML, uh, use these kinds of algorithmic ways to generate vector embeddings uh, or just embeddings for uh, words. And now we have moved towards this, um, this way to generate them using uh, deep learning models. So to answer your question, um, they're just two completely different ways. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hey, hello. Uh, so it, it was interesting seeing the uh, data plotted out um, when you were showing the numbers. Uh, what and, and you said it could rotate in 3D, but what dimensionality are vector embeddings usually? I always imagine they were like highly, highly dimensional. That's a great question. So the way that they are actually able to, we are actually able to see this 3D is because we can actually uh, UMAP the, embedding, the vector embeddings down. Um, but the dimensionality of your vector embedding depends on your vector embedding model. And uh, that's also why vector embeddings are so tough. So OpenAI's uh, vector embeddings are 1536 dimensions, 1536. Um, my typical go-to sentence transformer is, um, 
uh, mini LM. Oh, what's up? Oh, this is embarrassing. Okay. Um, I forgot what it's called, but it's 384. Um, it's not MPNet. MPNet is 768. Um, so it will depend. And there's some that are like 1024. I think the ones that clip fit, I think I want to say it's, I want to say it's 1024. It might be 2048, um, but it just depends on the model. Does the uh, size of your data set that you want to embed determine the dimensionality? You're gonna Absolutely use? not. Nothing oh. to do with it. Okay. Thanks. Didn't Bill Gates once say we'd never need more than 64K of RAM or something like that? <laughs> Clearly, we need more than 64K of RAM. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a question in that when you say vector embeddings, they're very model specific, right? So let's say I want to build a RAG application and I want to use OpenAI GPT-4 for that. So when I you know, embed the new data through RAG, it has to be via GPT-4 only, right? I cannot use any other LLMs to, like, to just generate the like rag context and then add it on top of the prompt, which then I pass on to GPT-4 because that would make no sense. Or am I wrong in this? You can use whatever embedding model you want to embed your data. The GPT is just one model that will produce vector embeddings for you. You can use any vector embedding uh, model that you want. And the reason for that is because the way that rag works is the way that, that rag works when you set it up is you take your data and then you embed your data with a vector embedding model, and then you put it into a vector database, and that's your setup for RAG, and then you put the LLM, let's say, on top of it, or, or however you want to visualize it, and you interact with the LLM, and the LLM will turn your, um, your question, your query, whatever, into something to, uh, to embed, in which it will then call the embedding model to embed that, and then... Uh, search the vector database, which will then return uh, the the text uh, associated with the embedding, which would, they will then use to give you a human readable response. So the uh, dimensionality of your vector embedding model and what vector embedding model you use has nothing to do with the LLM, but you do need to use a consistent embedding model when you're doing RAG. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for that talk. Um, as you might know, Google claims that the new Gemini model is able to pull in 10 million uh, tokens in its context. And uh, my question is in the world that we have models that can expand to that context, uh, what would be the use case uh, for these uh, embedded databases? Because from what I understood, you basically use it to inject data into the context. That's RAG. So that's one use case for vector databases. Um, uh, I guess I'll touch on two things for this. So one, um, vector databases have many use cases outside of RAG. So Zillis's main customers are actually product recommendation. Um, and that's because vector databases offer basically a better solution than collaborative filtering. And the other one is, um, Oh, the other two are uh, drug discovery. Um, those people, uh, they need to be able to run large scale searches against large scale uh, amounts of vectors. And then the third one that's interesting is autonomous driving. And autonomous driving basically starts at like 10 million vectors minimum, probably more close like 100 million vectors. Um, and they don't use an LLM in that at all. Uh, in response to the RAG stuff, the main problem that we see with large context windows is that um, they lose context in the middle. So if you go look up this thing called the loss in the middle problem, you'll see that uh, this is something that people have been trying to solve for a while. Now, of course, Google claims that they have solved this problem, um, but I have seen no evaluations. Where's Giscard? Who's, where's the Giscard people? Giscard, where are you? Dang, they're not here. Okay. Well, there's an evaluation company here called Giscard, and they'll probably, if you reach out to them, they'll probably tell you more about it. Um, but I have not seen anything that really shows that they have actually solved this loss in the middle problem. Um, but also, like, you know, 10 million tokens, like, it's not really enough to 
ingest your, let's say, proprietary database, your info set, things like that, uh, 10 million is actually not big enough yet. Now, once they get to 100 million or a billion, like maybe, like, I don't know. Um, but in that case, like, you know, then you have the, the cost issue because it costs a ton of money to ingest a lot of tokens and to output a lot of tokens. And so I don't know if you saw Claude's, um, uh, Claude 3 costs $75 per 1 million output tokens. Uh, and that's just, that's just too expensive really to use uh, reasonably. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, so Rack application based on what I saw so far, uh, the usual problem is them they have a lower relevance score. I understand that it's possible just to tune uh, vector embeddings, uh, tune your model, and tune parameters, and how you select documents. Like uh, you can turn all of it. Um, is there any any examples like if you try and tune this uh, to to extremes that you're gonna get like a good relevance scores that probably can be referred to or tried out? Uh, relevance scores, like how relevant the retreat. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. So you're going to want to talk to the people at True Era. Um, I don't know a lot about that. Um, and uh, my the only solution I've seen for this is people who will embed the answer and search the question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I strongly reach, recommend reaching out to True Era. Josh Rainey at True Era is, uh, is an expert on this kind of stuff. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, looking for your uh, advice and expertise on, on which of the you know vector databases to choose. For my rag, it's I just this. yeah. Uh, for my, <laughs> of, yeah, right. Um, I picked up whatever came along because right now every every uh, vector database looks pretty much the same. Um, but as things go, I mean, as the you know data volume goes up, uh, you know you need something more than the metadata, and you need uh, you know something that. Uh, a, a kind of a whole database definition language that you use on this to clean up old data and you know do a lot of things, right? So just just trying to understand which of these uh, you know uh, you showed a list of vector database companies, which of these are really on the forefront of um, thinking all the way far along? It's Melvis. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, no, let me let me let me tell you why. I'll 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 give you the pitch. I won't just tell you it's Melvis because I work there. Um, look, so I will just cover WVA, Chroma, and Quadrant as they are open source vector databases. Just go look at the repository and see how many lines of code are written into each of these repositories. If you add up all of the lines of code written into WVA, Chroma, and Quadrant, you will not reach the number of lines of code written that's in Melvis. Now, number of lines of code is not necessarily the only indicator of how robust or how uh, featureful a system is, um, but it, I think it is a pretty strong indicator, especially for database systems, especially for distributed database systems, um, because distributed database systems need quite a lot of robustness. Um, and what I'll offer for you to think about with this is, you know, Oracle has 90 million lines of code written on their Oracle database. And the next one that comes is MySQL with about 2 million. So Milvis is about the size of MySQL and actually it might be bigger than that now. Um, and what it offers is feature sets basically designed for enterprise, role-based access control, you know, auto scaling, uh, this kind of like uh, filtering, multiple types of filtering, hybrid search based on both the text and uh, multiple vector search. Um, it comes as, it's the only one that comes as an automatic distributed database. Uh, there's a true separation of concerns on search data and uh, indexing. Um, there's a lot of different features that go into it and I can definitely point you to a page that kind of tells you uh, more about it. Thank you very much. I'm sold. I'll take a look at it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I have a question about the here yeah, okay. uh, 3D stuff. So you mentioned that one of the use cases is for um, uh, medical use cases trying to screen for medication. A lot of these have 3D structures and when they're trying to, um, you know, within the receptors, the molecular structure, et cetera. 
Um, the question is more a curiosity as to how does a 3D structure um, appear here versus, for example, a 2D image? Um, so um, uh, the let me let me think about this. So a three like how would you vectorize a 3D image? Okay, so they have specific models that do that. Uh, and the vectorization of their models are going to be you know, different for each company. And the only reference that I have for this is uh, like drug discovery, basically. What they have is they have a ton of vectors that uh, represent many, many different types of um, you know, existing chemicals that they have. And what they need to do, actually, so I think some of these are AI generated. But what they need to do is they need to find like how close these are to... Um, solving the solutions they need to solve. And so they have a specific embedding model that is aimed at that specific solution. Uh, as opposed to how it would appear here, um, I mean, probably the same way people represent chemicals in like organic chemistry, like you know, some rings and some lines and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, hi, Eugene, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, uh, yeah, thanks for your talk today. I wanted to learn more about the learning process of these embedding models. I'm kind of curious, say like given a set of images or uh, some examples of text, um, how does the learning kind of occur in an embedding model? Do they start with random weights and maybe go through the architecture or try to minimize or maximize some kind of cosine distance between similar or different examples? This task also feels unsupervised to me. So just kind of curious if you could kind of describe, even if at a high level, what this process looks like, uh, say, pre-transformers or even post-transformers era kind of thing. Yeah. Sure. How familiar are you with traditional ML? Have you taken an intro to ML class? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're familiar with the way neural nets are trained, back propagation, gradient descent, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. That's the exact same model. That's, that's the exact same way that uh, embedding models are trained. Embedding models are typically supervised models. That's why uh, I say it's very, very important to have the context. And it's very, well, this is why data quality and all those data quality tools are important is because they will ensure that your context is you know, high quality data, input data into the model so that your model is actually able to, um, to, to, to basically give you the relations that you need. So it's the exact same, randomized weight, Back propagation, gradient descent, supervised learning. Uh, how is this supervised? Sorry, uh, uh, it's, like uh, it's like a, like a, what you can do is you can give it. Um, uh, oh man, like two two words or like a word and image or like some words and some images that are uh, uh, supposed to be related. And it will just try to find like the best correlation for this. Oh, okay. So supervised is not maybe not the correct. Maybe it's like semi-supervised learning. Okay. Um, unsupervised learning, what you can kind of do with these kinds of things is you can start trying to do basically like k-means clustering. If you know, like, hey, I've got ten, you know, I've got ten. Um, whatever clusters. Yes, thank you. Then you can get k-means clustering, but that doesn't actually help you with the vector embeddings. But you can use that to uh, determine how your embedding models are. But typically the way that these are trained is that you give it two things that are relevant and it learns these relevance uh, relations. Thank you. Um, so first off, the title of your talk sounded really dry and boring, but you made it super <laughs> engaging and fun to be in. So Thank bravo you. and encore. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. My, my question has to do with, um, honestly, the latency of uh, handling things like object-based access control type con uh, uh, authority on content that you're retrieving. Okay, um, like on Milvis. Yeah, so I was curious if you were familiar with uh, what how that works databases internally. actually support that and how it all fits together. Yes. Uh, so. Basically, you just check for these like, so the way that data is stored in Milvis is we're going to get down to bits. So um, basically, you've got, you've got a bunch of bits. 
And some of these represent the ID fields, some of these represent the embedding fields, some of these represent metadata fields, blah, 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 blah. Um, the role-based stuff is actually put on top of it. And so basically what you would do is you would pre-filter for some things. And uh, then you would know whether or not, so I, I'm not entirely sure if this is exactly how the role-based access control is implemented, but uh, this is how the pre-filtering for uh, expressions or metadata is implemented. And as far as I'm concerned, these are basically the same thing. Uh, so what happens is it runs in linear time because it runs through your entire set and it checks for the expression or the metadata to equal a certain field. So now you have, so you have one pre-checking that's a linear runtime. And then what it does is it creates a bit mask. And then um, when you apply the bit mask, you actually have a much more efficient vector field, uh, vector check, because what you can do is you can now drop a huge chunk of your vectors. And the most expensive part of vector search is actually the computational part of vector search. And so with the right free filtering and you know, role-based access control, expression filtering, metadata filtering, all of this kind of stuff, actually what you get is a much faster return time because you're dropping a lot of the computationally expensive pieces of the, uh, of the search. By the way, I think vector embeddings is all you need is not a dry and boring title, so. <laughs> That's a very engaging title for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'll take the. Why don't you tell me a better title next time, and I'll rename my talk. <laughs> uh, so my question is: You mentioned that there are distributed vector data databases. So I have worked on distributed systems in the past, but the way you distribute databases through uh, sharding or partition, and it's always through a key. So I want to understand how it is being implemented in the vector database. Is it through clustering? You decide the number of clusters or how exactly do you partition a vector database into different components? And then how do you access each component based on like which key or whatever is implemented here? Okay, I have to pull up a, a something like an image for you to look at because I can't explain this without like a visual. Uh, oh shit. Okay, you know what? I, I can't find it. I don't want to like. I don't want to like dig around too much. So I will try to explain this without a visual. Um, okay, so shards, uh, shards in. Gosh, where is my screen now? Oh, okay. Shards work like uh, this. So the way that so okay, so Milvis is a distributed system that's modeled as a pub sub system. So you can think of the way that data gets written into Milvis as the same as basically you're writing data to a bunch of Kafka topics. And the topics can represent, um, I believe you can think of the topics the same way you think of like partitions. Uh, and what happens is as the data gets written into the system, you, uh, each data is basically plugged with a timestamp and that's how we ensure consistency. And um, the way the consistency works is when you do a read, you check the timestamps and you check your consistency. So Milvis has four types of consistency. Number one is eventual consistency. That's the most relaxed version of consistency. Things will just come in as they are. And then you have bounded consistency, which ensures that all, re all, that all writes within a certain time of your last, of your read execution will be returned. So all writes uh, will have to be finished. And then there's session consistency, which in, uh, ensures read after write for your specific uh, instance. And then there's uh, strong consistency, which ensures read after write for um, the, 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 the entire uh, set of replicas. Um, sharding is the way that we do uh, write consistency at scale, right? So each shard, I believe, can handle about 25 million uh, writes at a time or so. Um, and essentially, if you have more rights than that, or, or you know, uh, yeah, if you have more rights than that, then you need to just add, add a shard. Uh, so sharding does that. And then the read consistency is basically just ensured by the timestamps. Uh, and actually, I mean, I guess it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, so first, when you put the data in, there's these nodes. So Milvis is a fully distributed system that has stateless nodes that 
have a control plane that um, controls the state of the nodes. And these nodes, uh, some of these nodes have access to growing data, and, but typically what happens is you will move data from permanent memory into your nodes as you need to retrieve it. Um, when you're reading data, each node will contain some number of things called segments. So Milvis has this uh, concept of segments, which are sealed blocks of a certain size that um, basically we build indexes on a sealed blocks of a certain size. And this makes it more scalable because instead of building an index on 100 gigabytes, we'll build an index on 50 indexes on two gigabytes. And then because it's distributed, we can do a parallel search all at once. And everything, um, all of the segments will do a parallel search and then they get aggregated at the node or segment, or, sorry, yes, they'll get aggregated at the node level, which will then get re-aggregated at the proxy level uh, well, I think it's actually replica and then proxy level, which will then also get re-aggregated and actually given the results will be given back to you. Um, but in terms of this kind of like consistency, it's mostly just timestamps and you use shards to increase your write throughput. So uh, we, so all the timestamps, so every single, every single entry into Milvis gets timestamped. Cool.